resolution. Okay, thank you very much, and, and thank you all for sticking around, and thank you, uh, Rick and, and Steve, for, for getting us together for this, uh, I think, rather inspiring meeting. So, so I want to tell you a little bit about our recent work on fitness landscapes, and I sort of try to emphasize in the spirit of this workshop some of the uh, interesting probabilistic aspects of this problem. Um, this is work that has been funded by the German Science Foundation within two uh, collaborative projects, one based in biology and the other one, which is perhaps more interesting in this context, is called Probabilistic Structures in Evolution, and it's actually funded by the mathematics section of the DFG. Um, so I want to do basically three things here. I want to introduce to you to the problem of fitness landscapes, and one of the reasons why people are now interested in this, again, is, uh, the, is, is an empirical reason, so there's much more empirical data now than there used to be, so I'll talk about that a little bit. I will then focus on what we call accessible mutational pathways, which are essentially pathways in a fitness landscape that are monotonically increasing in fitness. Um, and if there's time, I will talk at the end also about adaptive walks, which, which give you a kind of sort of more dynamical view of how populations actually evolve in these landscapes. Now, a talk on fitness landscapes basically has to start with uh, Sewell Wright, uh, who introduced this notion in 1932, um, and who introduced it mainly to make clear that in his view of evolution, there is a problem uh, with, with um, uh, many, uh, uh, that, that evolutionary problems typically have many solutions, which can be viewed as peaks in the fitness landscape, and there's an evolutionary problem to understand how you get from one peak to the other, how you can cross valleys, and this eventually led to the um, development of the uh, right shifting balance uh, theory. Now, in this, uh, in this 1932 paper, there were two illustrations. One is, is, uh, what, uh, is an illustration of the space of genotypes to the extent that it was known to write. Um, and you see here in these pictures, there's always a wild type, which is this cross, and then you have mutations. So in this case, there's a mutant at locus A and a mutation at locus B, and then you have the double mutant. Here we have three mutants, which then make up uh, three mutations, which make up a little cube, and so on. So Wright, of course, was very much aware that, that the space of genotypes is a discrete space, and it has a structure of a hypercube. Now, to sort of make things more, more uh, um, uh, easy to understand for, for, the, for, for his audience, he also included this picture, which is a kind of two-dimensional cartoon of a landscape with peaks and valleys. And, and I think it's fair to say that historically, the second picture is really what has survived. So this is what you will still find in a lot of biology textbooks and also in many talks at evolution conferences. But of course, it's misleading in, in many ways because the geometry of the hypercube is very different from the geometry of the plane. And this is something that I will, will try to emphasize in this talk. So, so let me um, introduce the mathematical setting, which is basically the setting that I showed you uh, in the illustration on the previous slide. So we're going to treat genotypes as binary sequences of some fixed length L. Um, there is a, they, are, they are binary, which basically means that on every site, you'd only care if you have the resident, the wild type, or the, the uh, mutant allele. And you can think of these as being sequences composed of 0 or 1 or minus 1 and 1. And there is some reason you know, to prefer one or the other. I'll mention that uh, a little bit later. And a fitness landscape is then simply a function on that space, um, and, and, uh, which, is, which is a measure of reproductive success of the organisms, mean number of offspring or something like that. Now, the notion of epistasis, which has come up a few times uh, during this conference and also today, in this context, simply means that there are interactions between the effects of different mutations in, on fitness. Um, and so uh, this essentially means that any function f of sigma, which is not additive in the contributions from the different sigmas, is an epistatic fitness function. So you can, you can argue about whether you should use additive or multiplicative as null model. But if you use multiplicative, then you can take the log, and then you have additive again. So that doesn't make much of a difference. The main thing is that. Of course, you know, most functions by nature have to be epistatic, and therefore epistasis is expected to be something that is very, very common. Now, there's a particular kind of epistasis that is important in this context, which is called sine epistasis. And this is a notion that, to my knowledge, was introduced by Dan Weinreich and collaborators. So sine epistasis means that the mutation at a given locus can be beneficial, that, it, that is increasing fitness or deleterious, depending on the background, that is depending on the state of other loci. Uh, 
And this is illustrated here for the case of two loci. So if you do a mutation at the first locus from, from uh, zero to one, where the second locus is zero, you see that fitness goes down. So it's a deleterious mutation. But if you perform the same mutation on the background of the one locus at the second side, you see that mutation, go, the, the fitness goes up. So this is, uh, this is sign epistasis. And since this is true for both loci, this is called reciprocal sign epistasis. And what you can see is that reciprocal sign epistasis gives rise to multi-peaked fitness landscapes, which is not a theorem, but you know, it's, it's, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll mention that a little bit later. So, so sign epistasis gives rise to ruggedness of fitness landscapes, and, and that's, that's the reason why it's important. Um, so, um, okay, so this is just, again, emphasizing that the space that, that we're looking at is, is this hypercube. And this is what these hypercubes look like um, as, you, as you increase the number of, of uh, dimensions. Um, so how, how, can you sort of, how can you sort of quantify um, the, uh, the, 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 the amount and the kind of epistasis in a fitness landscape? I already mentioned the fitness peaks that, um, uh, that uh, Wright uh, worried about. So obviously, you can count local optima. So optimum is simply. Uh, a site where fitness is larger than all one mutant neighbor. So I should say, I, I didn't mention that, but of course you have, you know, as a sort of natural distance measure on the hypercube, you just have single mutations. And with respect to that distance measure, uh, this is the definition of a maximum. If there is no sign epistasis, it's easy to show that there is a single optimum only. Uh, and on the other hand, it, it's known that reciprocal sign epistasis is a necessary condition for the existence of multiple peaks, but it's in fact not a sufficient condition. So this has been shown in some recent papers. Now, in, in this talk, I want to, I want to um, uh, mostly look at a different notion, a different um, uh, quantifier of, of uh, fitness landscape ruggedness, which is uh, uh, based on this notion of selectively accessible path introduced by Weinreich. Um, where we say that a path connecting to genotypes, where the, the initial genotype has lower fitness than the, than the final one, is called selectively accessible if fitness increases monotonically along the path. So this is sort of a notion that is based on the, um, on the idea that, that you're in some sort of strong selection weak mutation regime, where mutations are, can only fix if they are beneficial, and then a population can, can sort of evolve along such a path only if it's monotonically increasing. And a nice feature of this, no this notion is that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence with the existence of sign epistasis. So if there is sign epistasis, then uh, there at least there are some paths to the global maximum that are not accessible and vice versa, okay? which was also proved by Weinreich and collaborators. Um, there is a third kind of uh, or somewhat different kind of quantification of epistasis that I want to mention here. Uh, also because it's something that sort of links this field uh, somewhat to computer science, I think. So this is a, so basically the idea is that you can expand any fitness function on the hypercube uh, in, in, um, in uh, 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 interactions of different orders where you have sort of the non-epistatic linear part here and the rest are then the epistatic parts. And in fact, if you choose these sigmas to be plus and minus one, then this is in fact an expansion in orthogonal, in, in orthogonal functions uh, which are eigenfunctions of the graph Laplacian on the hypercube, and, and they are called Walsh functions in computer science. So this is sort of a nice you know, way of, of representing uh, the, the interactions. And then you can sort of sum interactions of different orders, and then you get something that we call a Fourier spectrum, which, which tells you how much weight there is in the different, uh, in the different orders of interactions. <clears throat> and in particular, you can sort of sum all the weights of interactions of order two and greater, and that gives you a kind of number that tells you how much epistasis there is in this in this uh, landscape. Um, okay, so, so I mentioned that that a lot of this recent work in this field has been has been driven by by empirical advances, and so I want to show you at least one example of an empirical fitness landscape. Um, so this is from our own work. This is uh, 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 these are data that were collected or, or generated by Ariane de Fisser for a fungus, Aspergillus niger. So uh, this is a, a data set that contains combinations of eight individually deleterious marker mutations. And what you're seeing here is sort of a five-dimensional subset of this eight-dimensional landscape. And the way uh, it's represented, so you have these genotypes which have zeros and ones. So the all zeros is the wild type, which in this case has the highest fitness because there are no deleterious mutations. 
Um, and so here you have these 32 different combinations. This is the five-fold mutant. And the arrows only always point in the direction of increasing fitness. And so you see, for example, here there are three local maxima where all the arrows are pointing inward. Um, and if you count how many of the paths from here to there are accessible, so they're all together five factorial or 120, you'll find that 25 are accessible and the others are not. Okay, so this is sort of the kind of data set um, that, that uh, uh, one can look at um, and one can analyze it in various ways. So just an example, this is the Fourier spectrum of that landscape. Um, and so these are the interactions of different orders. This is the non-epistatic piece and these are the epistatic parts. And the, the, this dashed line is what you would get if you assume that fitness were random. So this is what we call the house of cards model. So if you just d distribute the fitness values at random um, on, the, on the hypercube, this is what you get. And so you see that the, this part looks rather random, but there's a kind of enhancement in the second order interactions for this particular landscape. So by now there are about 20 of, of these data sets for different organisms and we published uh, last year, we published a kind of meta-analysis of these empirical data sets and I just want to briefly mention it here. So this is sort of a list of the, the, the so 10 data sets we analyzed in this, in this particular paper um, and they are partly these are um, uh, mutations uh, uh, that, that are in the genome of entire organisms. So there are two bacterial species here. This is this Aspergillus niger data set that I just mentioned. This one down here is actually nine-dimensional and it has, this is from a plant enzyme and there are some, but there are also uh, data sets that look at single genes in particular. Model system here is the beta-lactamase um, enzyme which, which confers antibiotic resistance to E. coli. So you see the sizes are between five and eight, four and eight. There are sort of different fitness proxies that, that uh, people have measured and these can be beneficial or del deleterious mutations. And they, they have been selected either for combined or individual effects. So, so basically the, we have a kind of toolbox of epistasis measures that we can uh, calculate for all these landscapes. And then you can, so, so one of the things that we were interested in here was to see whether um, whether these uh, different measures in some sense measure the same thing. Um, and this is illustrated here. So this is, these, these plots compare different epistasis measures, some of which I have introduced, others not. So for example, n max down here is the number of, of maxima in the landscape. Um, and and uh, up here is the number, what we call the number of crossing paths. So these are these accessible pathways. And these different letters correspond to letters in this table. So you see here that that um, sorry, um, that uh, that you know the, the, they are sort of arranged in a certain way, and one of the things that you should notice is that uh, if you if you sort of order these different data sets according to how rugged the landscape is, they typically tend to uh, uh, align in the same way. So, for example, this A landscape is typically uh, uh, is very smooth. In fact, this is a landscape that doesn't have any sign epistasis. So out of those 10 data sets, I think it's the only one that doesn't display sign epistasis. So there's only one maximum uh, and all the pathways are accessible. The B landscape is a little, little bit rougher. The, the Aspergillus landscape is G is up here, which is typically rather rough. And so you see, so, so the main thing here is that these sort of, the, the way these symbols fall in, in, in this plane is, is more or less consistent between different pairs of measures. And you also see a line. Now this line is calculated with a model. So, so the other thing that we wanted to know was whether it's possible to somehow uh, uh, you know, parametrize uh, these data sets using uh, uh, some simple models. And this is actually a parametrization by the so-called rough Mount Fuji model, which I will introduce in a moment. Um, and, and so you, although of course, you know, these, these points don't really fall on, on that line all the, all the time, but you can see that the overall trends are fairly well represented by this model, which sort of interpolates between a limit of a smooth landscape and a maximally rough landscape, which is the lan landscape where you pick all, all the, all the um, uh, um, uh, fitness values at random. Okay, yeah. Can you just say, um, is it easy to say quickly what you do when you've got missing data? I noticed on the Yes, okay, that, that's a very good point. So, so basically, um, yes, yeah, so, so you typically, so these up here are all complete, but these ones, they are missing data. So in the Aspergillus Niger case, because you know, we, we know, we, we, we collaborate with, with the person who actually got the data, and so we have the raw data, 
So there we actually convinced ourselves that the missing data presumably had fitness zero. So we, we assigned fitness zero to them. We estimated that it's very unlikely that we have missed them for statistical reasons. In this data set, this is not so clear. So actually what we did there in order to analyze it, because for some of the analysis you need to complete it, you know, for example, in order to calculate this Fourier spectrum. Um, and so, so there we, we did, um, uh, we, we basically did a kind of uh, linear interpolation. So we fitted, we fitted a linear model to the, uh, to, the, um, to, the, to the incomplete set and then, then used that to sort of fill in, which of course makes it a little bit smoother. But in principle, these are the you know, two things that you can do. Um, and sort of interpolating based on how far away things are in packing distance in some sense. Well, I think we basically just, f f we, we fitted a linear model and then we just took the, 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 the fitness values predicted by the linear model. But, that, for but the, the, the sort of input is fit, you use fitnesses that kind of like neighbors uh, no, I think we no, I think we, we just take the linear. I mean, the linear model has like nine coefficients, and then we just you know calculate the fitness from the linear model. So we assume so. And that so that, that that sort of in some sense implies that oh, there's less at this stage. So it's just the linear yeah. model as in presence and absence. Yes. Of, yes. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Yes. Sorry, yes. Yes. No that's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but this is of course, and, and, and I should say, you know, one of the, I think the, the important problems here is how do you get from these sizes, you know, to thousands or tens of thousands of loci, and in that situation, of course, you'll have lots and lots of missing data. So these statistical issues, I think, are, are very important and are sort of beginning to be addressed, but, but I'm not going to, to really mention them here. Okay, so um, are there other questions at this point? Okay, so, so let, me, let me go on to the, to the modeling part. So, so we're looking at, in order to describe these data sets and also to learn more, more generally about, um, about these uh, landscapes, we look at models which, which I call random field models. So this is a term introduced by Peter Stadler, and it just means that you have some probabilistic setting in which you assign fitness values uh, to the genotypes. And the simplest way of doing that is to just fitness, assign fitness at random, okay? And this is what we call the house of cards model, a term that was introduced by Kingman in a slightly different setting. But this model really, I think, was studied first by Kaufman and Levine in 1987. And so, so the nice thing about the house of cards model is that you can do some stuff analytically. So for, in particular, there is a simple uh, um, um, combinatorial argument telling you something about the selectively accessible path. So let's suppose I'm at a distance, Hamming distance D from the global optimum in my landscape, and I want to know what is the expected number of uh, direct selectively accessible paths. So a direct path is one that approaches the maximum by one step uh, each in each with each mutation. Now, of course, the total number of such paths is d factorial, and each of these, along each of these paths, you will encounter d fitness values. So f0 is the first one, d minus one is the one before the optimum, and then of course you have the, the optimum, which is sort of, which you know is already, is the global maximum. So the path is accessible if these random numbers are uh, uh, in, in ascending order. And so since all permutations of these random variables are equally likely in this model, the probability that a particular path will be accessible is one over d factorial. And so since there are d factorial paths, the expected number of paths is actually one. So this is sort of, you know, a very simple argument, which I should shamefully must, must admit we discovered numerically, but once you understand where it comes from, uh, it's not so, so hard. But I think it's sort of interesting, and it's maybe, and it's, this is independent of the distance. So, you know, where, however far you are, this will always be true. And this holds in particular for the longest path, which are at distance L, okay? Now, you might think that this, this means that it's easy to find these paths. But, but this is in fact, this, this, this um, result is in some sense very misleading uh, because if you look at the distribution of the number of paths, which we did numerically in this paper, it has a very peculiar shape. So this is the, the probability of finding n accessible paths uh, for different sizes of the hypercube from five to nine. And you see it has a big peak at zero. So, so the most likely uh, realization is that there is no path and then there is a fairly long tail and together these two things sort of combine to always give you a mean of one. Okay, So that tells you that this is a, a widely fluctuating quantity and the distribution is clearly not well characterized by the mean. 
So you need at least one other quantity. And so we like to look at what we call the accessibility. So this is simply the probability that there is at least one path. Right? So 1 minus PL of 0 is the accessibility. And so PL of 0 is plotted here in the inset. So this is the probability that there is no path for the house of cards model. And you see that this tends to appears to be approaching 1 in the limit of large L, which means that in a large hypercube, you will not with probability 1, you will not have such a path. And this was actually subsequently proved. I'll come to that on the next slide. But I also want to mention the, 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 the second plot here, which says constrained house of cards model. So constrained here means this is the version of the model that was introduced by Carnero and Hartle. And there the idea is that you, 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 um, you constrain the what we call the reversal genotype, that is the point opposite to the, um, to the, to the maximum, to have the smallest fitness, right? So basically, you know, if you want to uh, want to realize that, you can just um, uh, so this is our hypercube. Um, so here we have, let's say, this is the maximum. And I want this to be the minimum. So one way of, for example, of, of, of um, uh, realizing that is to assign zero fitness uh, here and fitness one here, and, and to distribute all the other ones uniformly between zero and one. Okay. Now, so so this so this obviously makes the first step a lot easier because you always know that the first step will be possible. But what is surprising is that it has a very strong global effect. And in fact, so this is the probability that there is no path in the constraint model. And you see that it actually seems to be going down again. And so this actually, this was an, uh, an observation that, that uh, mo has motivated uh, some, some mathematical work that I want to mention, in particular by Peter uh, Hegarty and Anders Martinson. This is a paper that is in press in the um, Annals of Applied Probability. So what they could prove is that there is a kind of percolation phenomenon here. So if you fix the fitness of the initial genotype to be F0, then if F0 is, is larger than log L over L, then the, the, this uh, accessibility will tend to 0. That, you will, that is, you will probably one not find a path. But if it's smaller than log L over L, in particular if it's 0, which is the case in this, in this constraint model, then it will tend to 1. Okay? And of course, in particular, if you don't constrain the initial fitness, then this is just the probability of finding a path. And so this tells you that this will approach unity as log L over L. Now, very recently, Julien Berestitsky and, and collaborators in Paris have extended this analysis to including also back steps. So suppose you allow for the path to not always, always go towards the maximum, but also to go back. This makes the problem, in some sense, much harder. So it's not even possible in closed form to count the number of paths in that way, in that sense, uh, in, in that setting. Um, but but what, they, what they were able to show, at, at least as a bound, and they conjecture this to be exact, is that then the accessibility threshold actually becomes independent of L. So, so, so there's a finite, even for large L, um, there's a finite probability of, of finding a path uh, to the global maximum if you allow the path to have back steps. And uh, this problem has also been analyzed on, on, a, on, on, a, on trees by, by, by us and by, by others. And so on the tree, you can sort of think of trees where you, where you scale the, the branching number and you scale the depth of the tree. And in order to sort of model the hypercube, you should scale the two in the same way, because the hypercube has a sort of branching number and a depth that are the same. And so if you do that, so if you scale h, if you, if you fix h over b and you take h and b to infinity, then it turns out that there is, again, a kind of accessibility threshold, which is at e. Okay, So when this is 2.7 then you go from having, uh, with probability 1, having no path to having a path with probability 1. OK, so this is very nice. But of course, the model, uh, this house of cards model, is not uh, really realistic. Uh, if you look at the, at the data, uh, so there is clearly a need for, for models um, that, that have uh, uh, you know, intermediate ruggedness. And so uh, there's uh, been some interest also in, in these uh, tunably rugged models. In particular, Kaufman's NK model should be mentioned here, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so I guess many of you are sort of familiar with this model. So there, um, you, you basically assume that each locus interacts randomly with, uh, with k other loci. And so you have a locus and its neighborhood. 
and within that set of k plus 1 loci, you again assign fitness at random. Okay? So this interpolates between the non-epistatic and the house of cards model. Uh, the other is the rough Mount Fuji model that I already mentioned that was in, uh, in, in introduced by Aita et al. recently, and we just published a, or, or submitted a, a, an extensive analysis of that, uh, of that model, uh, where you basically you, you, you define some sort of a reference sequence a sigma zero, and then you say fitness is, is varies linearly with distance from that reference sequence, and then there's also a random component. So this is a, an IID random variable. Theta is a parameter, and, and when theta becomes large, the landscape becomes smoother. And so for that case, actually, Hegarty and Martinson were able to prove that this accessibility uh, to, uh, uh, converges to one for any positive theta. So as, as soon as you put a little bit of, of this linear piece, uh, the, the, um, these uh, uh, landscapes become accessible. But I, I won't talk about this model anymore in, in, the, in the remainder of the talk. I want to focus on the NK model because it has, I guess, what, um, to my mind, a little bit more of what, what Daniel Fisher the other, other day called the smell of biology. I mean, it's not a lot of smell of biology, but a little bit. Um, in the sense that in this model you can implement something that is somewhat reminiscent of genetic architecture in the following sense. So, so I said uh, before that, that here you, know, you, you let each locus interact with L minus one other loci, um, but you have to, of course, define what these loci are. Right? And there are sort of different schemes in which you can do that. So the most commonly used version is, I think, the random choice. So here these arrows just indicate, so this locus I. So in this case, locus I receives sort of input in its, in its fitness contribution from locus 1 and from locus j. Uh, and locus j maybe uh, receives input from this one and this one. So you basically choose your interaction partners at random among the other loci. So this is the, the random version. But of course, you can also do this in a kind of one-dimensional way and, and always choose uh, sites which are adjacent along the sequence. And finally, you can do it in a kind of modular way. That is, you subdivide your sequence into, into parts into blocks, and within each block, everybody interacts with everybody else, and between blocks, there are no interactions. And so it's, it's sort of an interesting question which properties of the fitness landscape actually depend on this choice. So suppose I fix K, I fix L, um, and I, I vary this genetic architecture. And this is a, a, a problem where there are some, you know, some, some results are known. So in particular, if you look at the fitness correlation function, so just fitness, fitness correlation function as a function of distance, uh, this turns out to be manifestly independent of the neighborhood scheme. I should warn you that there are some, a number of papers in the, in the literature which claim that this is not true, but, but the, the most recent one uh, is actually has settled that, so this is, uh, this is certainly true. Uh, and this implies in particular also that the Fourier spectrum is independent of, of, the, uh, of the genetic architecture. But for other properties, this is, this is less clear. So in particular, uh, the block model, which was introduced by Perelson and Macken in 1995, uh, uh, is, is, is nice because you can calculate things analytically, and you can in particular calculate the expected number of maxima. And if you now compare that, and there has been some uh, rigorous work by, by Rick Durrett and others um, on, on, the number, on the asymptotic properties of the number of maxima. And so if you compare uh, this expression to the rigorous results for the adjacent model, you find that they're very close. They're not the same. Right? So, so there are clear differences, but, but so, so our experience also with, with the number of accessible paths that I will get to is that sort of with regard to average properties, the genetic architecture doesn't seem to matter a whole lot, but with regard to fluctuations, it appears to be very important. So we have looked at, at this uh, problem of accessible path in the block model, and we derived this expression for it, and I'm just briefly going to explain to you how that works. So, so the basic idea is, that in the block model, uh, any path can be decomposed into subpaths which are within one block. So every time you do a step in a path, you change one locus, this locus will be in one block, and the other contributions will not change, right? So only one of the contributions in your sum will change. Um, and so, and obviously, if you want the path as a whole to be monotonically increasing, then the condition for that is that all these subpaths are monotonically increasing as well. Um, and so that means that um, a given pathway spanning the whole landscape is accessible if all the subpaths within the blocks are accessible. 
Um, and so, so you need you need all these pathways to be accessible, but then you can sort of combine them in different ways. So there's a combinatorial factor which tells you how many in how many ways you can combine the subpath, and therefore the number of blocks, the number of path in the full model is just the product over the number of path in the blocks times this factor. And since the, the, within the so each block is a is a house of cards model, so within each block, uh, fitness values are IID random variables. So if you take the expectation, the expectation here is one, um, and so you find that the expected number of blocks is this, this, this quantity, which is actually very fastly, quickly increasing um, for any k which is not equal to L minus one. So as soon as the landscape is not completely random, the expected number of paths will be very large. Uh, at the same time, you can also calculate the accessibility, so the probability that you will find such a path is equal to the probability that you find it in the blocks to the power of the number of blocks. And since this is a number that whatever it is, is between zero and one, you see that if you keep k fixed and you take L to infinity, the probability of finding these paths will actually go to zero. So, so this is a rather extreme case of this, of this property of these um, pathways that I, or, or the, the, the pathway statistics that I mentioned, which is that the expected number uh, becomes very large, but the probability to find uh, at least one path goes to zero. Right? So which tells you that there are a few exceptional landscapes which are highly accessible, but most of them are not accessible at all. Um, so this is now um, comparing different uh, neighborhood schemes. Um, for the, for, so this is the mean number of accessible paths versus L. Um, and the colors, different colors correspond to different values of k, and the different symbols correspond to random adjacent and block models. And you see that the, the symbols are very close to each other. So, so basically, that tells you that just as for the number of maxima, with regard to the mean number of path, it doesn't, the genetic architecture doesn't matter. But if you now look at the accessibility, so the probability of finding at least one path, you see that for the block model, which are these pluses, this goes down very rapidly. We know that it goes down exponentially, and we can calculate the rate when, when k is sufficiently small. Um, but for some of the other versions, it actually goes up. So this is, for example, the random model for k equal to 3. It seems that accessibility becomes large. Right? So, so it seems that the, um, at least, and I should say this is, and this is even more pronounced if you go to larger k, um, but I should say this is for system sizes that, that can be simulated. We have reasons to believe at least for small k, that eventually this will go back down to zero. But we have no, so we're trying to prove that at the moment, but, but we have no way of, of sort of, at this point, to estimate where that actually happens and whether this is in a sort of reasonable uh, range or not. Okay, so, so in the last couple of minutes, let me, let me say a, a few things about um, adaptive walks. So, so, so far I have, I have looked at these landscapes from a sort of purely structural point of view. So we just asked, you know, are there paths that can take me to the maximum? This is, of course, if you look at the reality, this is a somewhat academic question because the question is not whether there are these paths, but whether an, an evolving, adapting population can actually find them. And so the adaptive walks models are, uh, you know, somewhat more realistic uh, in, that, in that sense. So what is an adaptive walk? An adaptive walk is a Markov chain on sequence space that so you have a you know you, you assume your population is monomorphic, which is true for small enough mutation rates, and it's constrained to move to genotypes of at larger of larger fitness. So you move uphill according to some sort of stochastic algorithm, and you terminate if you reach a local maximum. Now there are sort of three flavors of these walks. Um, one that that I call the random adaptive walk. Uh, where all you just you, in every step you just choose one of the fitter genotypes at random. There is a greedy adaptive walk where you always choose the most fit one. Okay, so then you, it's a sort of a steepest ascent. Um, and then there is this what, what I call the true adaptive walk. This is the one that was introduced by Gillespie, and this is sort of the one that actually comes out of the population genetics background. Um, so there, so if you if you do say the right Fisher model and you analyze it for uh, weak mutation, strong selection, you find that the transition rate is proportional to the, to the fixation rate, which is proportional to the fitness difference between the resident and the mutant genotype. So here, actually, the transition probability depends in a somewhat non-trivial way on, on your environment. So these are sort of three versions, and the, the quantities that have been of interest in the past 
is mostly the length. So people wanted to know how far do you, you know, go before you reach a maximum. But I think also an interesting question, which I think hasn't received much attention, is the achieved fitness. So how far do you actually get? You know that you will end up at a maximum. But of course, these maxima are not arbitrary maxima, but they are maxima that have been selected by the process. Right? Um, now again, most of the work has been done in House of Cards landscapes. And here, if, if you look at the random and the greedy cases, those are fully determined by the rank ordering of the fitness landscape. So you don't, don't actually have to worry about the distribution of the fitness values. And there, there are, there are a number of results. So Fliebiag and Lautrup showed that the length of these walks is, proportional, is, is, is log L plus some constant, where L is now, I mean, L is a dimensionality, but it's really the number of uphill directions that you have initially. I mean, you don't really have to care about the part of the genotype which is not uphill, um, so, so, so it's log L, so it's, you know, it, it's very short. I mean, the, 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 these accessible pathways that I described to you previously have length L, but here we see that typically you only get uh, up to distance log L, and if you're greedy, you actually get much less far, you only get to distance 1.7, so this is a nice result by OR. Um, now in the true adaptive walk, um, things are a little bit more complicated. So there the distribution actually matters. And we showed some years ago that it's still log L, but there's a coefficient that depends on the extreme value index. So for the mathematicians, I should say these are, so in particular, a rather complete derivation has been given by Kavita Jain, but this is certainly not a proof. So this is sort of, you know, for, for mathematical purposes, a conjecture. Uh, and what you can sort of see is that this true adaptive walk becomes effectively random if you make uh, if you make the distribution uh, if you push the distribution deeply into the Bible class and it becomes greedy if you if you push it deeply into the Frechet class, class which is sort of also what you expect. Um, I don't think that's that last bit. Uh, I, I, if you look at uh, Kavita's latest. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Yes. I mean, there is an issue here whether you should maintain the, uh, the assumption that the transition probability is proportional to the fitness differences. This is what we assume here, but this may not be the right thing to do. I agree, yeah. Um, right, so, so what about the height? So this is a very recent result by Stefan Novak, uh, where, where he looked at the walk height in the House of Cards model, right? So we know that the, the, um, uh, the, the walks, the random walks are log L, and the greedy walks are, have length 1.7. And so what Stefan uh, was able to show that uh, if, you, if you look, so you know, just for, for concreteness, say we, we choose the fitness values uniformly, then of course an, a, a generic maximum will have, value, will have a value uh, 1 minus 1 over L, right? Now here it turns out that these random adaptive walks do a little bit better, so they go up to level beta or 1 minus beta over L, where beta is this number. Which, which you can express in terms of an, of an integral. But the greedy walks actually do even better. And so they come up to a level of 1 minus 0.4 over L. And again, so these are sort of constants that you can write down as series or integrals. Um, and, and so this is more or less an, an, an exact result, which I, th I found somewhat, I mean, you know, from the outset, I wouldn't have known which way to, to, to guess, right? I mean, is, is greedy adaptation better? Given that, that it, you know, it, it, these walks are so short, it, it, it's not obvious at all that they really uh, get, get further. Um, now what about the length? So, so uh, Stefan has also looked, about, looked at uh, walk length in, in NK landscapes. Again, here the block model is easy because the walk length is additive. So we have an explicit expression for the walk length in the block model, which is shown here by these, uh, by these uh, red symbols. Uh, this is the greedy case. So this is now the walk lengths divided by L over K, this, this coefficient here. Um, and so what you see here is that the other, uh, so the architecture matters a little bit. And the random, for in the random, uh, randomly connected NK model, the walks are typically a bit longer than in the, in the, in the block model. But again, it's not, not um, the, the, the difference is not dramatic. Um, and again, you can also look at the walk height. And this is, I think, rather, again, rather surprising. So this now the fitness difference between a greedy walk and a random walk at the, at the final point. And uh, you see that um, it's, for the block model, it's always positive, just like in the House of Cards model. But for the random model, it seems to be sort of non-monotonic. So it actually, 
for intermediate k, it seems that the random walks are doing better than the greedy ones. So I don't, I don't really know what that means. Um, I thought, I don't know if there are still any computer scientists in the audience, but, but I, th I feel that this is something that computer scientists probably know something about. Okay, so let me, let me um, conclude. Uh, so I've shown you uh, some examples of empirical fitness landscapes, and they provide some insights into the patterns of epistasis. We have uh, looked at the, these uh, random landscape models, and I think these landscape models, beyond their sort of mathematical interest, are also really useful to, to develop some intuition for what you should expect to, to happen when the, the dimensionality of the genotype space becomes very large, right? Because there's, this is a problem that is hard to explore experimentally. It's also hard to explore computationally, but perhaps mathematically one can, one can do something here. And so we have some results, but as I said, the, the, the conclusion is not so clear cut. It sort of depends on what, what measure of accessibility you actually look at. And at the end, I, I gave you some results for these um, adaptive walks, uh, which sort of complement the view of landscape structure in terms of um, a, a dynamic point of view. And finally, I want to acknowledge my collaborators. So this is a group in Cologne, uh, students and postdocs. And in particular, also, I want to acknowledge um, Ariane de Fisser, our experimental collaborator at the University of Wachani. So thank you. Yes, yes. No, there's there's a clear connection. I mean, so the obviously, I mean, in the so in the spin glass context, uh, you know, these these accessible pathways are essentially zero temperature trajectories. Is, is sort of what we're looking at, right? So if you do sort of zero, so this random adaptive walk is exactly a zero temperature metropolis dynamics, um, and so you know, we, I, I sort of I've talked to spin glass people. We haven't really. There hasn't been a point at this uh, so far where, where you know it's been really useful to sort of transfer concepts. Uh, the, 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 ex the, the, the satisfiability problems, I think, uh, are uh, should give you some possibly some insight into these NK models because, in some sense, the clauses. So you know, if you sort of add clauses, then uh, this is sort of similar to adding these different terms uh, in, in the NK model. So I'm you know I'm certainly aware of that connection, but. It hasn't, from, for, for our work, it hasn't been turned out to be productive, but that's maybe only because I haven't been able to get the right people interested in this stuff. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, going back to the early part of the talk when you talked about these empirical fitness landscapes, I sort of find these things interesting, but also don't know quite what to make of them when thinking about how they might or might not generalize to you know, landscapes involving thousands Side. Do you have, like, I mean, what would you do if you could do it? I mean, given that you obviously cannot construct anything near complete fitness landscape for a thousand side, <coughs> mm -hmm. do you have any thoughts on, like, what should people measure to try to characterize these much larger landscapes? Yeah, so what, what people have started to do, so there are, you know, there are a few papers that have tried to. Um, analyze sort of large-scale data sets um, in, in this landscape context. And one of the things that, that they do, which I think is, is sort of uh, a nice approach, so, so basically, you know, so you know that your landscape has this, has this decomposition. But of course, this has, you know, this has two to the L coefficients. So if you want to have all the coefficients, you need all the, you know, this is the same problem as having all the data. But so what, what people have done, and there is a paper by the Bonhoeffer group that, that does this for, for HIV genotypes, and there's a more recent one by Otwinowski and Nehmenmann who have done this for the, for the LAC uh, promoter, I think, um, is, is that you try, so you know, more, more sort of uh, modestly, you could try to estimate second order effects because there are, you know, there are sort of, uh, there are only uh, L square second order coefficients. So, and, and so this is what people have done. So they have, you know, tried to fit a quadratic model, and then you can either say, well, you know, maybe higher order effects are not important, or maybe one can try to estimate the, the higher order effects, uh, or maybe one, one just takes the, this quadratic landscape as it is, and then you can try to, to analyze its properties, you know, see how rugged is it, are there many maxima, and so on. Um, I have a question about that. Um, so, you know, 
let's imagine that you had a thousand loci and there were only fifth order effects. There were no for there were no second order or fourth order effects. And you did what you're suggesting, you would find something that fit pretty well with only second order effects, wouldn't you? Yes. So <coughs> that seems a little frustrating. Yeah, yeah, sure, but uh, you know, I think this is sort of, I mean, uh, this is what, what what people are trying to do. I, I'm not sure if if if, if it's if, it, and I think it's an interesting question, you know, to try to understand uh, uh, how, how well is that expected to work. And 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 there's some a recent preprint by by Otvinovsky and Plotkin where they sort of try to, you know, compare different models uh, uh, with regard to this 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 sort of um, this bias that you just mentioned. So if you have the wrong model. You know how how well can you do and so on. But I think this is sort of the direction in which things are moving. I'm not sure, uh, you know, what 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 the um, conclusions will be at the end. In the end, but but I think it's uh, yeah it's worth trying. Yeah. So the the Fourier expansion suggests uh, you know another model for landscapes, which is that you know you just take the the coefficients in the expansion as being in say independent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. random variables mm -hmm. with maybe you know just the distribution depending on what the level of interaction is. Right. <clears throat> Has anybody sort of looked at models like that and been able to sort of compute anything about them in terms of... Well of course this is basically, so if you truncate at second order this is a spin glass, this is sort of the Sheraton Kirkpatrick spin glass model, right? Of course with, well, with, with random fields. Now I should, but, and, and people have looked at spin glass Landscapes in this context. So I should, but I should say, if you, you know, an important difference between spin glass models and, and NK models, for example, is that in the NK model, by the way it's constructed, uh, these coefficients are rather sparse. So many of them are zero. And this is maybe what you would also hope to be true for biological data. I think there is in the Otvinovsky data set, there is some indication. That you know, if you because you always you have, you have all these coefficients, and so if you sort of over you know you have a problem of overfitting, and you can try to suppress the small small uh, effects, and then you get something that is sparse. Whereas of course in the Sheraton Kirkpatrick spin glass, these would be Gaussian random variables, so they would all be of a similar size. And also in the spin glass context, people have looked at what they call p-spin models, where you instead of having quadratic interactions, you have uh, interactions of order p. Uh, I think this was was done by by Derrida. So in that in that setting, you know, this is model. People have worked with these kinds of models, and of course they are. Um, I should say that the you know the the, the the reason. I mean the the fact that the NK model is is becoming popular again is maybe also more historical. I mean it's not not necessarily the case that it's more realistic than say a Schering Patrick spin glass. But I feel that having something that is sparse is probably going to be useful. Especially with regard to this proliferation of coefficients. Yeah. Are you aware of any work on um, modeling these edges so they accommodate, say, weakly deleterious effects? So, so this it seems like if you had this strictly increasing sequence of fitnesses, yeah, then that that has an implicit assumption about population size. That's but right. But it might yeah. be that if you have smaller population sizes, some of these edges can be traversable. If the fitness well, you have two. In fact, you have two effects. I mean, so at smaller population sizes, you might be able to traverse weakly deleterious links, but of, of course at very large population sizes you have clonal interference and then you will be able to tunnel through valleys. So that also, and, and this we have sort of investigated in simulations, so we have done simulations on, on uh, one of these empirical landscapes and then you see that when the population size is, you know, so that n, n times mu or population size times mutation rate becomes substantially larger than one, then you start crossing valleys, and then these, these monotonic pathways are not relevant anymore. So then the population tends to go off somewhere else. We haven't done this for the, for the sort of weakly deleterious ones. Now, in, in terms of analyzing uh, pathways in this more general case, of course, you know, in principle, you could, take, uh, you could take your landscape and you could, for example, impose a, a kind of tolerance and say, I tolerate epsilon fitness decrease. And then you can ask, how does the statistics of the past change as you take epsilon to zero? So that, that, that's, I think, an, a well-defined problem. We haven't done that, but I think it's, it might be interesting to look at that. It just seems like that might mirror the, the success of the random strategy for searching these long, long paths, maybe. Yes, yes, right. that's right, yeah, yeah. Okay.
guess um, the, uh, this phone call with uh, the speakers.